So previously we've seen the row space, uh, and the column space, and the null space of um, a, a, a matrix A. Here, uh, as you will note, any space, um, we now need to think about, and when we think of any, uh, any vector space, it's interesting to try to find a basis for that vector space. So obviously if there is a row space of A, uh, of any matrix A, and there's a column space of any matrix A, there should be it should be possible to find bases for these spaces. So there, it should be possible to find a basis for the row space of A, and it should be possible to find a basis for the column space of A. So um, here, we're going to look at how we can find these bases um, sets, which are the basis for the row space and column space of A. Now, there are two rules, uh, two theorems. Uh, one of them states that, so these state, the first of these, states that elementary row operations do not change the null space of a matrix. So if we take the matrix A and perform row operations on it, it does not change uh, the null space. Similarly, uh, an, uh, this, uh, a similar one says that elementary row operations do not change the row space of a matrix. Now we can use these ideas, in fact, to use um, reduction of a matrix, in fact, to discover where um, the bases of a matrix uh, lie. So if a matrix R is in row echelon form, then the row of vectors uh, with the leading ones form a basis for the row space of R. And similarly, the column vectors with the leading ones of the row vectors form a basis for the column space of R. So essentially it means that if we were to take, uh, if we look at a row reduced matrix, let's say R equals, let's look at this matrix R. This is in uh, REF, so it's in reduced, uh, it's in row echelon form, sorry, row echelon form, so it's in REF, in row echelon form. Now if you look at this, um, the, the row vectors, in fact, so these row vectors, in fact, form uh, a basis for the row space of R. So they form a basis for the row space of R. These three form a basis for the row space of R, the reduced uh, matrix. And similarly, these column vectors, C1, C2, C3, in fact, form a basis for the column space of R. So here we have two sets of bases for R. Now, if we actually now use these ideas that since elementary row operations do not change the null space or the row space of a matrix, clearly we can, in fact, uh, take any matrix A, reduce it, uh, in fact, uh, to its uh, REF form, and then from the REF, in fact, pick out the matrices with the leading ones, uh, the non-zero rows with the leading ones, which form a basis for the row space of R, which is the reduced REF uh, version of A. But this means that since the uh, since the elementary row operations do not ex affect the row space, so the basis for the um, the basis vectors for R are in fact the basis vectors for the original matrix that was reduced. So this in fact gives us a very easy way in fact to to find um, a basis for the row space of a matrix. And similarly, uh, for the null, uh, the null space is a little different. Uh, we'll look at that a little later. But here. The, we can easily find the basis for a row space of A by reducing a matrix. For instance, let's try and look at an example. So let's look at this matrix A. It's a 3 by 3 matrix. And let's perform our row operations on this matrix because what we want to do is we want to find a basis for the row space of A. So if we do that, what happens is when we perform row operations on this matrix, it actually becomes um, by simply eliminating the two multiply the top row by minus 2 and add, we end up with, so we end up with, um, with this first, which is 1 minus 3, 4, 0, 0, 1, and then when we, and, and of course this second one will also be the same, so we end up with this, uh, basically, which clearly will go to the finally reduced matrix, this one, um, you can show that yourself. It's quite simple. By just subtracting the first, uh, second, uh, the second and third rows, you end up with 
this. Now, here's the point. Uh, according to our method, what we've got is in fact these two row vectors now. 1, minus 3, 4, and 0, um, uh, 0, 0, 1. Okay. So these two form a basis for the row space of A. All right. Now we can, of course, there is a similar uh, a similar way we can look at the leading ones, and in fact find a basis for the column space of A, and that in this particular instance uh, turns out to be. Now, by the way, uh, it forms a row space of A. There is another theorem that allows us to do the following. It says that using uh, these two also form a basis, but the original ones, uh, which are these one minus three four and 2 minus 6, 9, okay, also form a basis for the row space of A. For the column space, uh, we can find a basis by looking at the leading one, so the vectors 1, 0, 0, and the vector 4, 1, 0. Um, form a basis for the column space of A. So now, now we've basically found uh, the basis set. Now let's go to the concept of a dimension. The dimension, as you will notice, of the column space in this particular example, the dimension of the column space and the, so if I were to say the dimension of the column space of A, Okay, we would say there are two vectors, so it's equal to 2. And the dimension of the row space of A is also 2. In fact, generally, the, uh, it's always true that the dimension of the column space and the row space of any matrix A are always equal. And this gives birth to the definition of the concept of the rank of A. So the rank of A is equal to the column, the dimension, sorry, of the column slash row space of A. Okay, uh, so it's a column or row space of A. So in this case, the rank of this matrix, so the rank of A is equal to 2, where this A, we're talking about this A now. So it's equal to 2. Now, taking the same A, if I were to solve AX equals 0, the homogeneous system, because I now I want to get, I want to use the same example to find the null space of A. In order to find the null space of A, I'll solve the system AX equals 0. Now I'll take my reduced matrix, so I end up with the system, in fact, I end up with this system. So I end up with this system, which clearly has an infinity of solutions. So this tells me that, of course, um, clearly X3 is 0, X3 is 0, and it tells me that X1 equals 3, x2. Because when I back substitute this equation, I'm going to get x1 minus 3x2 plus 4x3 equals 0. Now x3 is already 0, we've got that. So when I put that in here, I get um, this, x1 is equal to 3x2. I let x2, for instance, let, be, let it be a free variable and let it be t. Then x1 clearly is 3t. So we end up with so we end up with here, x turns out to be t times, x1 is 3t, x2 is t, and x3 is 0. So we end up with this. Now, as you can see, these are the infinity of solutions. We clearly see one thing um, which should be obvious to uh, you, and that is, first of all, this, well, the infinity of solutions, this is the space we're talking about. So this is your null space. So the null space of A is the space spanned by spanned by three one zero. So this vector spans the null space of A. Now think about it. If the vector spans the null space of A, there is another theorem we already know, which is that a single vector in a set, which is not the zero vector is always linearly independent. So this vector 
spans the null space and is a linearly independent vector, which means it is a basis, also a basis for the null space, null space of A. Now here's the last theoretical part we need to think about, and that is um, the dimension of the null space. So the dimension of the null space is called the nullity okay, of A. The nullity of A is the dimension of the null space. And in this case, in this example, the nullity of A is 1. Okay, final idea, the rank theorem. The rank theorem states, uh, the rank theorem states that the rank of any matrix, N, uh, M by N matrix A, okay, so A is an M by N matrix, then the rank of A plus the nullity of A, okay, is equal to n, which is the number of columns of A. Now that's important because the number of columns are important in the sense that they are the number of columns tell us the number of variables in this linear system of equations. So the rank of A plus the nullity of A is equal to n. Now let's demonstrate the rank theorem for this particular example. So in this example, the rank of A is uh, 2, the nullity of A is 1, and the number of columns of A is 3. So clearly, the rank theorem holds in this case. And we've just demonstrated the rank theorem. So that basically con concludes the uh, all the concepts associated with finding bases for null space, finding a basis for the row space, the column space, the rank, uh, and the rank of a matrix, and the nullity of a matrix. Now, one important thing to keep uh, to note from this is the uh, nullity of a matrix tells you the number of free variables also. So the nullity, uh, the nullity um, gives us um, gives us the number of free variables. Okay. Now in the uh, number of free variables now or number of parameters. Okay, um, in the infinite solutions uh, of a homogeneous system. So here you can see that nullity is 1 in this example, and clearly we have only one parameter here, which is t. So we have just one parameter. So therefore the nullity defines that for us. Okay. Uh, one final result, if A is an M by N matrix, then if M is greater than N, we say that the system AX equals B is consistent for at least one vector B in Rn, okay? And we call this the overdetermined case. So the overdetermined case. It means you have more, more equations than the number of unknowns, essentially. On the other hand, if m is the opposite, the m is, m is less than n, in fact, if m is less than n, this is that if m is less than n for each b in Rm, ax equals b is either inconsistent or has infinitely many solutions, and this is called the underdetermined case. So that is just a couple of ideas that to keep in mind when one is solving systems as to what we can expect. And the second case, as you will see, uh, clearly indicates that the number of unknowns is more than the number of equations, in fact. And I think that concludes um, all the material.